Okay, well, welcome. Um, give me a thumbs up if you can hear me okay. I'm working all right. Okay, so we're going to be talking today about Agile Principles and Risky Barbecue. Um, and so what we're going to do is go through and look at a uh, risky barbecue that I did with my, my family and uh, and look at how we were able to use Agile Principles to help make it, um, to lower our chances of failure. And then also talk about how those things will relate to your team. Uh, so this is going to, the, the goal here is to get us seeing Agile from a different perspective. So we're gonna be talking a lot about barbecue and other things uh, like, like that. So if you only like hearing stuff about Agile within the context of your work, this probably won't be very exciting. Uh, now, yes, these are not nunchucks, these are, um, whatever you call those tongs. So I'm, I'm dressing the part part today. I've even got whatever this thing is to grab stuff. None of these things were actually used in the barbecue we're talking about. Okay, so to give you some background, um, our family does big parties usually a few times a year uh, where we, we get together with a bunch of family and friends and listen to a book, uh, read through a book together over the course of a few months, and then we rent the movie theater and watch the movie if there's a movie of it. Um, also in the summer, we uh, do these big slip and slides. So like, here's an example of, well, this was a smaller group. We did this one time, I think we had 150 people here um, and no one was hurt too bad. So we've got these big events things we do here. Here's another view of it. Um, so far, everyone has left with all the teeth they, they came with, maybe a few bumps and bruises. The, uh, the blanket at the bottom is, uh, without the blanket, people ended up way off in the weeds um, because it's, you can't really tell, but it's a pretty steep hill in our, our backyard there. Anyway, we were reading through the Chronicles of Narnia and then watching the, the movies that, that were with that. Uh, so one, one time, like here's a picture of our, our group, uh, Shed Farm is the farm my uh, fam family has. And um, that's in, in the movie theater. So we were going through that. And we're like, okay, we've got this big party. What do they eat in, in Narnia? And it was like, okay, well, reading through it, something like medievalish food. So the first time we tried this, we were like, okay, well, what seems medievalish? Maybe people eating uh, big, you know, drumstick, turkey drumsticks or something. Um, so this was this was the early one we tried. Yes, Turkish Delight, which I've had. We tried that one time when reading the books, and it really just wasn't that good. But anyway, I guess if it's magical, it gets you to do all kinds of horrible things. Betraying your, your siblings and stuff. Um, anyway, so so we had these drumsticks. Uh, these were, were pre-cooked, but we... Pretty big group. If it goes bad, it goes bad at a very large cost, and then we gotta go get pizza or something, something like that. So we took two of them, uh, put them on the grill, cooked them or warmed them up, made sure that that worked, tried them as a family. It worked well, so we bought another 50 or so of them and then had the, the big party. And it was a huge success and everybody loved it. I'm not sure what percentage of them actually got eaten because it was a massive amount of food um, and you gotta look all medieval when you're eating it and stuff. So this was, this was a lot of fun. Anyway, uh, the next book, we, when we came to the Voyage of the Dawn Treader, we were trying to figure out what did they eat in the Voyage of the Dawn Treader. Um, one of the things they do mention eating is peacocks. Um, this is a picture of my mom's peacock. And when I told her that they ate peacocks in the Voyage of Dawn Treader, she's like, you're not touching any of my peacocks. So that, that was out. A friend of mine uh, who has helped us with many of our escapades like this sends me a text message that looks something like this. He says, you know what you need to do next time? I'm like, what? He said, you need to pit roast a whole pig. I'm like, have you ever done that before? He said, as a kid, I did it. My dad was the town dentist, and that qualified him to sew the pig up after it was stuffed with seasoning. I'm like, with such expertise and experience, how could we go wrong? Let's try it. Now, keep in mind, he hadn't actually done anything. He had only seen his dad sewing it up. Somebody else was handling everything else. But our expert was acquired. Um, and I want to point out something in this, that there is a huge amount of value in getting someone on your team who has done whatever it is that you're trying to do, or something similar to it, or at least has seen it done. Uh, and, and this is really, this is one of the roles of an Agile coach a lot of times, is to come alongside your team and say, hey, I know this is possible, this this can be done, here's how we did some work. Doesn't mean that everything we did on this other situation will work, but at least having somebody on the team that, that has the experience to say that what you're trying to do is possible is a huge step forward. Um, they probably have lots of information about things that didn't work uh, to, to try to avoid or things that didn't work for this other team that you ought to just be very aware of. Maybe you can get them to work. But that, that expertise of 
And, and I'm not talking about an expertise. Like in this example here, David wasn't like an expert person with, with roasting pigs, but he had been somewhere and seen that had been done uh, before. And as we'll see here in a minute, that wasn't a normal experience for uh, most people we checked with in, in this. So we knew, um, we knew our stuff would be something like this, right? We dig a hole, we put fire in the hole, we put a pig in the hole, then we bury the pig, something happens, and then eventually you have, have dinner to, to eat. Um, so there's, there's this section right here, number five, that's a little bit concerned because we don't know exactly what happens, and it's underground, so you don't really get to see, right? Um, so I start checking with people and I check with our local, uh, the butcher block. Cause I like, you know, if anybody's done this, they have, and like, do you know anything about pit roasting a pig? And, uh, the reply I got back was that the owner did this for his birthday. I was like, great. I'm wanting to talk to someone with experience to lower the chances that we'll end up eating pizza. He goes, uh, we ended up eating pizza as his birthday party. I'm like, oh, okay. So like even this person who, who owns the place that you go and, you know, if you're wanting good meat. He had the experience of they, they dug it up afterwards and it was just bad ruined meat. So they ended up um, buy, buying pizza. So after checking with some people, David was the only person I could find that had said he had actually seen this done successfully, apart from a few people that said they were in, uh, had seen it done, done in Hawaii. There were eight other people that we checked with, including one of our local churches that tried doing this and they dug it up after it being overnight and had just a bunch of ruined pork meat and ended up having to buy chicken. Everyone we checked with uh, thought it was, sounded like a great idea, but they had never experienced it actually working. Um, if we end up here, we end up having to order pizza and throwing away about five hundred dollars worth of, of pork. It was a uh, the the cost of getting this wrong was was pretty high. So this is risky, right? We're we're trying something here that's that's fairly risky. Now, does that feel familiar, right? You've got something you're trying to do. There's lots of unknowns. Lots of unknowns. Many similar projects have failed, and your failure will be expensive. Now, your, if a software project fails, it's probably a lot more than, you know, $500 expense, but for a cookout of, hey, we're having some friends over, that's a pretty major, uh, major failure right, right there. Um, and, and one of the things that happens with the, with what we did with the turkey legs, we could actually test cook, you know, get a few of them and test cook it, cook it and see, see how it goes. Um, drumsticks were much lower risk because we were able to try something really small and try it. Uh, we started with something that we could make successful, right? So kind of in this, uh, we were able to deliver a meal and everything with these turkey legs, kind of learned some thing, things from that, but we weren't able to take the same approach when it came to dealing with, with the pigs. So I talked about how this sounds risky. So this sounds like a job for Agile, right? So I'm going to walk you through kind of what we did, the things we, we tried and how we, we worked through this and look at maybe what that means for your teams, ways that you might work with your, your teams. Uh, start with the guinea pig. I have not heard that suggestion be before. Um, I know they are a delicacy in some places. I'm not sure we would have gotten many people to stay for dinner had we tried that. Okay, so first of all, I, I use my um, young unpaid labor and we say, okay, we need to big, dig a hole big enough we can pit roast a pig in it. So they start on that. And I, you know, I helped them with it. I was like, if we do just a little bit every day, we can dig a hole. So they're in there digging, trying to dig this hole. And as you can see those rocks, we've got a layer of rock over everything. So you got to pull that out. And then it's just basically solid clay underneath that. So they're digging and we've got picks and all kinds of things. Um, and, and it doesn't take too, we're, we're not making super great pro progress here. So if we go back and look at our Agile principles, it says Agile processes promote sustainable development. Sponsors, developers, and users should be able to maintain a constant pace indefinitely. Okay, so after a huge amount of work, this is all the progress we had made after it rained. Um, the amount of work required for the number of inches dug was not going to be sustainable. So what is the Agile solution here? My question for you is, what does your team do when something is unsustainable? And I'll tell you what, what we ended up doing. So what does your team do when the work is unsustainable? Do you plod along anyway? Just say, well, we'll just, you know, I'll put in my time every day. Do you leave for a different job? Do you ask for help? Do you just despair? Um, do you communicate to management that this doesn't follow the Agile principles? Oh, I just realized this isn't going to show you this. Let me make a quick change here to fix this. 
It's showing it nicely on the screen that you are not seeing. Okay. So go ahead and put your put your answer in there. Do this. There we go. And Jake, thanks for posting that that again. So what does your team do when the work is unsustainable? If there's something else you think of, feel free to throw it in the in the chat. Um, asking for help, so that that's great, right? Trying to come up with a make to make it sustainable. It's it's kind of unfortunate how many of us just plod along in, anyway. And I'm not I'm not criticizing because I know that's easy for me to do too. Oh, we just this is what we do. This is what we've been given. We've just got to do our jobs. But if we're really working on a highly functioning agile team, that shouldn't be what's happening, right? Oh, my hand cuts off there. Okay, that shouldn't be what happened. We shouldn't be just plodding along anyway. We should be asking for asking for help. Um, hopefully not despairing. Although it looks like four percent of us are doing that. Um, or communicating to management like, hey, we're not following the Agile principles. How can we work together to follow the Agile principles better? Love it. So our Agile principles say build projects around motivated individuals. Give them the environment and support they need and trust them to get the job done. Well, my motivated individuals here were my kids. So we had a conversation that went something like this. This clay is very hard to dig through. I said, okay, what do you need? My kids go dynamite or, or a backhoe. I said, let's try the backhoe. Um, I, the idea of dynamite sounded intriguing. Um, I don't have a license for it, although I do know somebody that used to, so I know who, who could probably direct me. Um, so that's what led to this. My kids learning how to use an excavator. Um, so they both got their chance to dig this hole. It wasn't, um, they are not skilled, super fast excavator operators, but they do know how to use one now and did a surprisingly good job. So we all got to take our turns doing that. That's my daughter learning how to do it. And here's my son running the excavator. So as you can see, we started getting a pretty decent size size hole here. That also gives you an idea of how steep the hill is that our house is on. So now we've got a pretty pretty good size hole that we're digging out here that I don't know how long it would have taken if we had to try to do that just, just by hand. But we were um, giving them the tools they need and trusting them to get the job done. And I, I did help them. It's not like we just sent them to go get an excavator, right? You know, I'm just not in the pictures here. Okay, so build projects around motivated individuals. Give them the environment and support they need and trust them to get the jobs done. Get the job done. So for your team, if you've got something that's not sustainable, what is the equivalent of a backhoe for your team? Is it another team member? Is it a temporary expert? Um, maybe a coach or something like that? Um, is it an upgrade, upgraded development machines? Is it additional environments to test in? Or is it better development tools? I mean, for, for the things that you run in today, which one of these is the backhoe for your, your team? If there's something that you think of that's not on here, feel free, feel free to throw it in the chat if you want. And the point here isn't that any one of these is right or wrong, right? It's that there probably is a backhoe something that would really enable your team if you're having trouble um, delivering a sustainable way, um, delivering quickly enough, um, do, or do, I'm sorry, quickly probably isn't the right word, delivering in short enough increments, what is that thing for your team? And I encourage you to look for it. Um, look for those, those things. And, and it's easy to often look at stuff that is, um, you know, like, buying a $30,000 backup. We, we rented ours, we didn't buy a backup. Although it was really fun to operate, which made me really want one, but we, we didn't, we just uh, rented it. Um, because we will probably never do this particular thing again. Uh, and anyway, but it's really easy to look for things that are very, very expensive, um, that are hard to do, but often there's low hanging fruit of the small changes we can make that will dramatically increase the what the team's able to do. Um, a better focus on tests. Better feedback even between team members, better feedback between people that we're doing outside of things. Those all may be things that are the backhoe in your particular situation. Um, and sometimes we we look at the things that we want that we can't get, like dynamite, right? Dynamite would have been really, really cool to dig dig that hole. I'm not in a position where I can get dynamite legally, uh, so so we didn't do that. Anyway, but be looking for those backhoes in, in your team. And I, I'd encourage you when you're working with your team this week, Ask yourself, what's actually holding us back and what is the backhoe that would let us get, get through that? And there may be many different things. Some of you may be able to do, some of them may be like dynamite and you're not actually allowed to do that without getting in lots of trouble. 
Okay, so here's our plan again. Remember, we need to dig a hole, put fire in the hole, put a pig in the hole, bury the pig, stuff happens, time passes, and then eventually dinner. So how do we handle the risk associated with this step, right? Um, if we get this step wrong, we're going to have a lot of ruined meat, and it's expensive, and we won't have the dinner that we're looking forward to. Well, in talking to some of the other people that tried this and had failed, one of the problems was is they were working with very large batch sizes, like 150-pound hogs, uh, very large back sizes. It was a one and done. We're going to try this, and if it doesn't work, it's a failure. They also were working situations where they had lack of feedback. Pig goes in the hole, you bury it with dirt. You have no idea what's actually happening under the ground until you dig it up to see what's, what's going on. Um, so what we started thinking about doing is, is there a way we can do this? Could we lower our risk by dealing with two smaller pigs? For a couple reasons. One, because we can pull one out and start actually trying it before we pull the second one out. But the other reason was, too, is it's a lot easier to heat two or to get two 50 pound hogs up to the temperature, the internal temperature they need to be, than it is one really large one, just because there's more mass that, uh, of what you, you need to heat. Um, so, so having two smaller pigs would increase our chances that we could actually get them up to the temperature and increase our chances that if one fails, we've got a, another one as a failback. Um, the other big thing is making, is having some type of feedback mechanism. So you knew what was actually happening in, in the pit. Uh, we had thought about burying stuff and running wires to it. Um, and we ended up doing something a little bit different, which we'll look at in different. So Back to the Agile principles, continuous attention to technical excellence and good design enhances agility. So what is technical excellence in pig roasting pit design? Any, any thoughts in the chat? What is technical excellence in pig roasting pit design? <laughs> no ideas? Cool. Any ideas? There's no wrong answers here. Controlling heat source, uh, meat thermometer. Holds the heat. No dirt on the pig. Oh, yes, that's a good one. No dirt on the pig. Uh, if, if the pig ends up covered with dirt, you, you've got a, a problem. Uh, the meat temperature, right? Some way to actually make sure that you're getting the, the right temperature. So in your software, if you're writing software, you have something that is an indication of whether it's good. Or maybe it's passing all the tests, right? Maybe it's being able to refactor and changing it. Yeah, maybe it's being able to deploy it. Oh yeah, the evenly roasted pig, that's, an, that's another one. So our idea of success is the meat's fully cooked and no one gets sick, right? And to do that, we need to make sure that the pit maintains an adequate temperature. And a lot of the people we had talked to, I think they had gotten the pit, covered it up, the temperature dropped, and they ended up with just a bunch of halfway cooked um, pork, which Pork isn't something that you want to undercook. My wife used to work in an ER where she saw patients that had eaten undercooked pork and got some parasites and stuff from it. You, you want to make sure you get, get that right. So how can we create confidence that the pit will maintain proper temperature? Well, let's test it, right? Let's see what our pit will actually do. So a week before we were going to do this, we uh, took the pit, Filled it up with a bunch of wood. We went through a lot of wood on this with our with our testing and everything. Filled it up with a bunch of wood and, and stuff and set it on fire, um, which worked out great, right? We got this big fire going a week ahead of time so we can make sure everything works good. And then I discovered another, remember the backhoe being a tool to kind of boost our efficiency? Leaf blowers are incredible at getting flames to go. So we uh, had a leaf blower on it, got it up really, really hot. And um, then I think we started it Saturday night. Um, so we got it going, and then instead of burying it, where we would have lost a lot of information, we actually covered it with tin and a tarp, and then you can see our thermometer is running it to see what the temperature is down, down inside of it. Um, and there's smoke escaping, but we try to trap in as much as, as possible. So this was, doing this ahead of time was our way of trying to get continuous attention to technical excellence and, and good design, right? We were trying to come up with a way that we could get feedback um, we weren't guessing. We were carefully taking measurements. As a matter of fact, I had while we were at church, I had a uh, video camera or a camera on this so I could check from church and see where things were at and we could record it so we could go back and see what was the temperature over time, when did it drop off. So very scientific approach here. And, and this is us uh, using another thermometer to look down in it and see what the temperature was. You're also doing a proof of concept. Yes, yes. Um, so we were able to look in and you can barely tell, but there's uh, this 
thermometer has a laser on it, so we're looking down what's actually inside at the bottom of the pit. And we're at 308 degrees. I think we were trying, we needed to be at between 360 and 400 for an extended period of time. So in Agile, we say working software is the primary measure of progress. Now, in this particular case, uh, we may not have been working on real data or the real pork, but it was definitely doing the work of retraining the heat. So we were actually operating this thing to make sure it, it worked and that we got good feedback of what does this, we got a hole in the ground, what does it actually do when we put fire in the hole? So this is us later checking it uh, the next even, uh, evening. And so we now had evidence that the pit could maintain 300 plus degrees for 20 plus hours. So this, this was awesome. That, that proved that we were able to get enough heat in, in the pit to do this. So like all of our risk goes away, right? How many people think all of our risk goes away because we've proven that we can, there's nothing that could possibly go wrong, <laughs> right? Okay, yes, yeah, so we got some thumbs down, that's, that's right. There are many things that could go wrong and we'll see them in a minute. So the Agile principle is our highest priority is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable software. So we had delivered a pit that maintains the required temperature. So question for you, is when do your customers get evidence that your software does what it needs? At what point in the process? Is it after it goes live? Is it because the testing proves that it works? Thanks, Jake. Is it at the demo? Is it in acceptance environment? Or some of our software doesn't even work in production? I had a conversation with someone a while back and they, uh, they said, we found a bug in production. And, uh, and, and we're going to deploy a fix for it. And I said, okay, that's great. Do, do you have a test? Did you write a test? They said, yes, we wrote a test. I said, the test fails when the bug is there. They said, yes. They said, okay, so you got this that you're going to deploy to production. So the test passes now, right? And they're like, no, the test still doesn't pass, but we need to deploy this to production. I'm like, I, I, we're not communicating about something here. Something, <laughs> something's missing, I don't understand. Okay, so um, a lot of the customers get evidence uh, software does what it needs at the demo. And that, that's a place where there's lots of evidence at, at the demo. Um, testing is another way. There's not necessarily a right answer here. Um, that at the demo is where we usually show here's what the, this does. There's also the need to actually show what it does with real data. And that might be somewhere other than the demo. The demo may show that we've got a, the, that we've coded what you ask for. There may be another point that, that proves what you ask for actually does what you want when you get to um, real live data, which could be an acceptance environment or a simulation environment or something like that. Or sometimes if you're working in very small batches, could be could even be production. Um, if you're demoing it and then getting it out that afternoon and people are trying it and giving you feedback, sometimes that is acceptable, depending on what the system is that you're, you're building. Okay, so the day before the roast, this is me. It rained, the pit filled with water. So I'm out there, if you watch me here, I think I lose the cup, uh, just accidentally let, let go of it. So I'm there getting water. So this kind of changes our, our plans a little bit here, right? But that's okay, we're agile. We're gonna welcome changing requirements even late in development. Agile processes harness change for the customer's competitive advantage, right? Um, welcome may be a little strong word here, but so here was our timeline. Uh, 6 p.m. on Friday, light the fire and keep feeding it. 7 p.m. on Friday, get the pigs ready. 3 a.m. Saturday morning, place the pigs. 12 p.m. Saturday, we're gonna watch the movie. 4 p.m., come back and remove the pigs. Let them cool down a little bit, and then around 5 p.m. we were trying to eat. So that was our that was our plan. Now I wanted to place them about six to nine hours earlier, but um, our expert was saying that he thought 3 a.m. was good, and he was willing to get up at 3 a.m. with me to actually get it in the uh, put it in the ground and stuff. And another guy that lives nearby decided to come. He wanted to get up at 3 a.m. to help us too. So these are the three of us that were out there at 3 a.m. Uh, dealing with this. Which brings up an interesting question. How does your team make important decisions? Now, ultimately, I was the person that had purchased the pigs, right? So, so I could trump anything anyone else said because it was my, uh, my financial investment. But we ended up doing it based on the person, on the expertise of the person. I mean, it was a conversation that we had to try to figure out when do we think is the best way to do this. And we talked about what's the risk? What if it's not completely done? What if we need more time? Um, could we push back uh, eating a few hours if we need to? We're like, well, we've got all the kids going up and down the hill on the slide. They'll be entertained. We'll be, we'll be good. 
Okay, so how does your team make important decisions? Was the movie watched Charlotte's Web? No, no, it, was, it wasn't. We were watching Voyage of the Dawn Treader. Um, yeah, I'm not sure that that is an idea. <laughs> um, or, or Babe. So uh, it looks like most of us are saying decisions are made by the people closest to the problem. And, and this, is, this is great, right? The person that, uh, in this case, the decision was made by the people that were going to have to get up at 3 a.m. and the people that were going to have to come up with different ways to handle things if, if it wasn't going, going well. The next po most popular one is the team makes the decision, which there's probably some overlap between these two things, right? Um, management makes the decision. There are times where that's appropriate, right? There are times where it's appropriate for management to make the decision. And then the person paying for the project makes the decision. However, I will point out that um, decisions aren't made and we're just stuck in, in limbo. So that sounds sounds painful. But even if management is making the decision or the person paying for the project, the customer is making the decision, those all should be informed by the team, right? Um, none of us know as much as all of us to, together uh, and we need those other perspectives. Now, management or the customer may have a different set of priorities. I've been on teams where somebody, the decision the decision made by some people on the team was going to head in one direction and the customer, the person that was looking at how much money it was going to take said, no, we needed to handle it, hand it, head in another. It wasn't because the person that wanted to do that was wrong about what they were trying to do, but there were other constraints that applied for the person that was having to pay for it. Okay. So we've got this principle, the best architectures, requirements and designs emerge from self-organizing teams. And, and that's what I wanted us to think about is how are we letting the teams kind of self-organize around it, whether it's the kids getting a backhoe or um, the three of us coming up with how we were going to do this. We weren't just following a blind plan as we got more evidence and talked through things we were trying to adjust, which is what your team should be doing as well. So once we got the fire uh, started, uh, it was time to sew up the pig. So you fill it full of vegetables and stuff and sew it up. And this is my daughter sewing it up. We had a doctor on site who helped get it started. And then my daughter wanted to see how what that was like. So she did, she did that part of things. Um, then we wrapped the whole thing in tinfoil, best we could, and leek leaves. Uh, we needed, we had heard you should use banana leaves, um, but those weren't readily available in rural Kansas. So we took both these pigs and wrapped them up good in tinfoil and then uh, put it inside of uh, chicken wire, hold everything together and put it on ice because we didn't want the meat to spoil before it needed to go in the, uh, before it needed to go in the, in the pit. So we ended up with two of these and that kind of gives you an idea of what, what we had. The uh, chicken wire is to make sure we could actually move these because when you, when you end up with the very soft meat, you know, that's so soft and tender, it falls off the bones. It can be very, very difficult to pick up. So we wrapped everything in, um, in uh, chicken wire. Okay, so 8 p.m. on Friday, we started our fire. So we've got the fire going. Um, I think we got kids throwing things in, built a, a nice big fire, fire there. And then, remember how I asked if you thought anything could possibly go wrong? Then on 11 p.m. on Friday, a thunderstorm rolled up, all right? Um, so we've got more rain. So not only did we have some dampness in it that wasn't part of our original plan, but now we've got rain and more water pour pouring in. So remember, we want to welcome changing requirements even late in development. Agile processes harness change for the customer's competitive advantage. And I want to suggest that sometimes, while we want to welcome change because it's for our competitive advantage, sometimes the best you can do is just deal with changing requirements. I'm not saying that we were welcoming the fact that we were having to deal with the rain, but we were going to find a way to make it work. So what was the competitive advantage? Sometimes you've really got to look at the big picture to wel welcome a change. So in your particular situation, um, how does your team respond to change? Do they relish the thought of adapting to change? Do they see it as a necessary evil? Do they see it as a way to make the software more competitive? Or do they assume the change is only due to the incompetence of others? So how does your team respond to change? It, it's interesting how frequently I see answer D here, um, that any change that comes up is seen as because other people didn't do their job right or didn't plan things ahead. And I think that's unfortunate, and I'm glad to see it's only 10% with the, the group we have here. I think that's unfortunate because it that, that perspective means that there's a mentality that we're not going to learn as we go and that we're not going to get to expect other people to learn as we go. 
And the most successful systems I've seen, uh, software systems that have been developed, assume that we're going to learn as we go and, and do a lot of reworking as we get new information. Um, and, and if we've got this idea that it's just because of the incompetence of others that they should have told this, this or they should have figured this out before when they ask of it, I think we leave a lot of, we end up with, with slower feedback loops, um, slow things down and end up trying to guess guess about things in larger uh, time frames. So instead of, well, let's try this. We think this is the best thing. Let's get feedback and iterate. It pushes us toward the situation where we try, well, let's plan really, really good. We'll try this, build a bunch of stuff and then hopes it wor hope it works. But since we've invested so much time, we're not gonna be willing to change it because we don't wanna be called incompetent. And we end up with a lot worse um, deliverables, a lot worse outcome because this mentality is there, including the fact that if I, if I'm on a, if, if I'm working with a team and our team sees any change request from the customer as being due to the incompetence of others, if I apply the same standard to myself, I am going to be, it's going to be a lot harder for me to be willing to make changes, even when it's very, very easy. It's going to be harder for me to justify making changes, even when they should be made, because they should be made, because now I'm admitting that I was incompetent. Um, so it, it, it just creates a very, very bad situation to, to be in. The, the big thing is, as far as incompetence, you, you now have, if you've got feedback, that's a chance to change and do things better. Um, just blaming on incompetence doesn't usually help, help anyone. And it's not that there's not situations where it's like, hey, we need more expertise in this area or something like that. But... Um, Seeing it as a necessary evil, and that's that's not, I mean, there are sometimes things like this is just what we've got to do, it's not necessarily fun. But the big one here is, uh, and I like that we've got 20% saying that they relish the thought of adapting to change, uh, but seeing it as a way to make the software more competitive, I think if we expect change to make us more competitive, we will do our development in a way, we will work in a different way that allows us to be more competitive. If it's just a necessary evil, we may not set ourselves up to take advantage of change in ways that actually create a competitive advantage. Okay, so back to our barbecue. This is 3 a.m. Saturday. This is the time we're gonna put, put the stuff in. And it, it's been raining and we, we rigged up something to try to keep as much water out of the pit as we could. So we've got a fire that looks something like this. So nice, hot coals. Uh, we've got that grid down there we're gonna put uh, stuff on top of. My, my friend came, he had a I don't know what you call a grinder to cut metal and stuff. It was, it was great. We were able to do all kinds of things. So this looks good, but our test burn data no longer applies, right? We did our test burn data when there wasn't any rain, the ground wasn't wet, and it hadn't just rained. Um, we're not even sure what's in the bottom of our pit now. It probably contains an inch of water at the very bottom from, from water that's come in and that's come in and water that seeped into the ground. So despite our best efforts, we now don't have any, we can't trust our dad, that our data of what we did before on the test burn actually applies now. And maybe it will be the same, but we shouldn't rely on that. So this type of situation though, you probably experienced as well. You know, have you ever been on a team and you kind of know how long things take and then you lose a member of your team or you gain a new member of the team um, and they need help getting up to speed and maybe they won't be as speed, uh, up to speed for, for a month of getting familiar with stuff, or there's new security requirements, or management changes directions, or you switch to a new technology, or everyone suddenly has to work from home. There's all kinds of things that can change it to where what you knew from the past, the evidence you had from the past, doesn't really give you as much predictive power of the future as you'd like it to. So we needed to be extra careful not to predict the future based on a different past. And this, this really, really applies to a lot of things you're going to run into in working on Agile teams because it's really, really easy to assume like, oh, this happened in the past um, and, and use that to predict the future. And there can be value in using forecasting like that, but you've got to make sure that the past actually looks something like the future you're wor working in. Um, and many times it, it doesn't. So this is 3 a.m. We've got the pigs. We're now placing the pigs. Um, we've got some rods to keep us from burning ourselves. There's my friend David on the left and, and Darren on, on the right. Darren's the guy that knows, does all the metal work and stuff and brought all the, helped make all this stuff work. David was the guy whose idea this was. So we're putting it down in there and we actually threw some dirt in on it because we were worried it was a little bit too, too hot. 
So we've got these in here and then we're going to cover it up with, um, we've got some rods that go across, tin on top of that, and then on top of that we put uh, a, a tarp like we showed earlier to, to keep all, all the heat in. So 11 a.m. Saturday, the internal temperature was rising but not fast enough. The rain had cooled the pit much faster than in our test burn. So since we hadn't buried it, remember the, the risk we discovered with a lot of people is they didn't know what was going on in the pit until they dug it back up. Well, since we've done ours in a way that we can actually uncover it, we were able to uncover it again, threw in some charcoal on the sides and got it burning to try to get the temperature up a little bit faster because we weren't hitting our goals. And the key thing I want to make sure we think about here is we were able to get feedback that the failures had not been able to get. People are getting hungry now. Yes. <laughs> Last time I did this, somebody said, you know, that they really needed a pork sandwich as, as part of this. Anyway, we, we got this going we, and we were also able to, since we left our, uh, since we weren't bearing stuff, I don't know if we've got it out here, but we were able to take the leaf blower and kind of goose it to get the temperature back up. We had a whole lot more control over the process than the places we had heard of that, that had failed. So question for you is, does your team use feedback to adjust the way that they work? And as you're working with your team, I would encourage you to think back, hopefully the mental image will stick in your mind of this big pit of uh, fire and thinking about how are you able to actually adjust the way that your team is working? Are you getting feedback in a way that you can change things in order to be access successful? Or is your feedback loop so, so large that you don't find out if it worked or not until it's either a failure and the project gets canceled or, um, or, or in a way that's more catastrophic than just we're readjusting as, as we go? 12 p.m. Saturday, everybody went and watched the movie. Almost everyone. David was really wanting to make sure everything worked well, so he stayed behind and watched the temperature and injected air and made sure that everything was progressing nicely. Um, I thought that was a good example. Build projects around motivated individuals, give them the environment support they need, and trust them to get the job done. David stayed to watch the fire to make sure the temperature stayed high enough. That was part, and he was just doing that as a motivated individual that really wanted to make sure that we had some good pork. 4 p.m. Saturday, we pulled one of the pigs out. So we got the pig um, and we wrapped it up really good and then let it cool down. So people are starting to show up. I um, can't remember how many people we ended up having at this. We ended up with way more meat than we needed. But so we wrap it up good here and let it sit for a while. Now I want you to notice though, something I think is important, where is the other pig? Well, the other pig is still in the pit, still heating. Uh, and what we were doing there was trying to create options, right? We didn't, we hadn't undone that. We didn't know what was inside this, but we now had one pig that we had pulled out. We could, if it looked good, we could know the other one was probably good. If it turned out it wasn't done, we could make sure we didn't pull the other one out until we actually had, uh, until we actually brought the temperature up, up some more. Here's some ways I've seen agile teams create options. So uh, some teams I've worked with, they've run their software in parallel for a really long time with the old system. So if they're replacing an old system, they run it in parallel for a long time and compare the old output to the new output to make sure it's doing what it's supposed to. I'm thinking of a billing system that they ran in parallel for a really long time and made sure it was doing exactly what it was expecting to, to create those options of finding things that were wrong uh, before they were had it actually completely running live. Is there another way to demo the pig without completely opening it up? We might have been able to cut into it or something. The way we had things wrapped, that would have been, been hard. But yes, that, there might have been a way to do that that we didn't think of. Um, another way, keep running the old system to fall back. I've seen people try to go through cutovers where they kept the old system running and they're like, hey, we're going to try to do a cutover. Didn't work. Okay, we fail back. Keep running the system. We'll regroup. We'll try it next, next weekend. And, and, but keeping that option to make sure they don't end up with something catastrophic. Um, enable enhanced functionality without removing the old. So this is all about creating options. I was working for a, uh, we were writing some software to for a law office one time, um, and we had a new way of doing things, but they were used to the old way. So we created a new menu item that had the new way of doing it, but left the old way there. And that way, if they ever ran into any problems with the new one, either didn't understand it, or maybe there was a bug, something didn't do what we expected, they could always jump back over to the old way and still get their work done. And that gave them a lot of options for how they got things done, kept them from ever getting blocked, and made sure we proved things out. Um, doing the risky cutover over a holiday weekend. Uh, I've been on teams that have done that. They were doing a big cutover. They tested everything. 
they tested the cutover many, many times too. But still, when they got ready to do the real cutover, they did it over holiday weekend. So they had, um, so they had a, oh yeah, fail back. I meant fall back. You're, you're correct. Uh, did it over a holiday weekend when they had a little bit extra, they had a, like a day of buffer where if something went wrong, they should have had time to, to fix it. So those are all ways of creating options. So after we were done this, I actually tweeted this. I said, last weekend we applied agile principles to pit roasting pigs. For example, instead of one 100 pound hog, we cooked two smaller ones. This allowed us to deliver one sooner and then use the feedback from the first to make the second one better. Um, I had some comment and reply and um, Ed replied and said, imagine how much you would have learned had you done 100 pound, 100 one pound pog, hogs. And we actually had done that previously and it looked something like this, right? We cooked 100 less than one hound, pound uh, pieces uh, of pork. So back to our principle here, deliver working software frequently from a couple of weeks to a couple of months with a preference for the shorter time frame. So for your team, what is the equivalent of delivering a single pig first so you can do it on a shorter time scale? What is the equivalent of delivering a single pig first so you can do it on a shorter time scale? Prototype, okay, so delivering a prototype, letting people use that. Splitting stories, getting your stories down to something smaller that you can deliver. An MVP, it's good. An MVP. Okay, so lots of people are doing the minimal viable uh, product. And most of the times when I've seen people do an MVP, there is an even more MVP than the one that they came up with. Um, but yes, these are all good way doing a spike. These are all good ways of trying to deliver something smaller and get feedback on it sooner. Uh, if you deliver a small part of what the customer has asked for, and then the customer says, oh yes, that's not at all what I want. It's way better to figure that out before you deliver the entire thing. Small incremental features, basic functioning software, small batches, craft a slice of the MVP for each iteration using stub responses from an API instead of actually calling an a API. And that can be valuable. There's obviously a danger there, right? Because if it turns out the API does something different, but that can be a valuable way to get uh, get feedback sooner, particularly if it lets them uh, let your customer give you feedback on whether it works. Because if what they ask for isn't what they wanted, it doesn't matter what the API does, right? <laughs> Proof of concept. Okay, so lots of ways that you guys are using, uh, doing the equivalent of delivering a single pig first um, so you do it on a shorter time scale and get feedback. Now, in our case, it's not like it's not like we delivered one pig and then another, right? We needed to eat, and these were kind of long uh, our processes. But it eventually was successful, and here's a picture of some of the people there uh, enjoying the the pork. I actually ended up busy and didn't end up eating of it any of it until the next day because I was busy running around keeping everything working. But it turned out to be a success. So our highest priority is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable software, or in our case, through continuous delivery of tasty pork. At regular intervals, the team reflects on how to become more effective and tunes and adjusts its behavior accordingly. Okay, so that's an agile principle. We should probably apply this to our barbecue. So we started asking ourselves, was it success? Yes, absolutely. Would we do it again? Probably not. What are the different agile lessons that we took took away from it? Well, some of the things that really stuck with me through the process is the value of working in small batches. You know, the small batch or the smaller batch of doing a test burn, uh, doing one uh, hog through, getting one hog through while we still had the option for the other. Uh, huge amount of value in talking to people that who had failed at it before, also people who had succeeded at it, or the few people we found who's um, which pig was the best, the first pulled or the sec second pulled. Um, I think they both, it ended up fully cooked. So I think we went ahead and just pulled the other one out once we had proved that it was okay. We had the option to leave it for longer, but I think we had ended up with fully cooked once we got the first one out. So they were about the same. One of them, they were seasoned a little bit different too. So it wasn't a complete, I couldn't say for, for sure. We also planned for changes, right? Um, uh, so Jake's got a good question. Did we learn more from talking to people who had succeeded or people who had failed? Uh, that's, that's a very good question. That's, um, I think I learned more from talking to the people who had failed because we became aware of just how many people had failed. Um, the quantity of people that failed made us a lot more careful of what we were, um, doing. 
And so I think it, it's almost as if the people we talked to that failed helped make us take the advice of the people who had succeeded better and look for ways to lower the, um, the, the risk. But very good question. Uh, plan for changes and, um, and then having some way of getting continuous feedback. You know, the thermometers being able to tell what was going on in the pit was very, very important to us. And all of these things are very, very key for any, um, any Agile pro project. One thing that I left out here is talking to people who failed, but also talking to people who succeeded. Just knowing that it was possible helped push us in the right direction. If we couldn't find any, like, so I grew, I live in rural Kansas, okay? Um, you may or may not have heard of cow tipping, which is where you sneak out at night and tip over cows that are standing up there that, that are, uh, are asleep. I have talked to many, many people who claim to know someone who has gone cow tipping. I have never talked to anyone who has actually gone cow tipping. I suspect it is just a myth. Um, having been around cows, I'm even more confident that it's a myth because I don't think a cow's going to let you just go tip over, you know, six, seven, eight hundred cow. Um, cow tipping is not a myth. Okay, well, we got somebody that says it's not a myth. So, Jessica, have you done cow tipping before? So I have not tried this. So that's interesting. If, if you have done cow tipping, tell me about it because then I'll stop misinforming people that I think it's a think it's a myth. <laughs> okay, well, if you've successfully done it, then I, I stand corrected. Um, I think there's a lot of people that think they know someone that's done it than have actually have actually done it. And I, I have been chased by bulls across fields late at night and stuff like that. So it's not like I haven't been around around cows, but um. I evidently it, it is something that someone here has done. So very interesting. Okay, so kind of in our retrospective, I get another uh, pigs have much worse than yes. Uh, I get this another text from remember this whole thing started with a text from Dave saying we David saying we need to uh, pit roast a pig. So I get another text from from David. Oh, and Lori, you're on the right track here. He said, pit roasting is cool, but I don't think we need to do it again. I said, I, I agree. Um, that, that was a good experience. I'm glad we did it, but that was a whole lot of work. I think there's other things we can do. There's, there's other uh, challenges to be, uh, to be had. And he said, you know what you need to do next time? I'm like, uh-oh, what's David thinking now? He said, let's get a stock tank and let's deep fat fry an entire hog. Um, we have not done this. I'm not sure we're going to actually do this, uh, but that was his... Um, <laughs> That was his idea. Somebody was asking how much the, the pigs cost. I think we had 250 pound figs. And I think the total cost was somewhere in the $400 range, some, something like that. Um, I may be a little bit wrong on that because it's it's been a long time since this happened. But I think that's what it was. Anyway, I hope that was useful. Interesting story. I encourage you as you're looking at your team, think back. Hopefully some of these images are, you'll have some vivid images of ways that we were able to use um, Agile with with doing a barbecue that will give you ideas for how your team can make progress um, as well. Next week, we are doing the curse of the testing pyramid. So you've probably heard of the testing pyramid. We are going to be talking about ancient Egyptian curses and about testing and how our testing pyramid might actually turn out to be a curse for us and what we can do about it. And we've got like lots of, this probably would be a good one to do around Halloween, but I'm gonna do it now. Um, Oh, cool. Tom's got some ways that we can make this a lot easier. I would love to hear your feedback. So um, if you can uh, go to the link, let me throw that link in here one more time. I'd love to hear what you think, thought of this. This was a different talk. Um, I did this about two years ago and I went through all the feedback before I did this to try to make some improvements to it. So I'd love to get your, get your feedback on this. Um, so yes, thank you everybody for coming. I'm going to stick a Stick, send out some of the pork. So so this was about two years ago. You do not want any of that pork. Although we did have it for a while because uh, there was quite a bit of pork to be had. So I'm going to stick a while around for a while. If anyone has